The Lord be with you. As you can see, today is a hymn sing Sunday, and I think Sarah did a very fine job in putting this together for us. We'll uh, find out by the end of it. <laughs> but no, she has done a very fine job. We will, um, uh, by the way, if you came in by the playground, you may have noticed that an entire side of the fence has been torn out and a big portion of our playground has been melted by fire. Um, someone who may have been driving while intoxicated uh, ran into our playground at midnight Friday night. So we will have that person in our prayers today. Um, You'll also hear in the prayers the name Maddie Bobrink, that is uh, Nancy and Earl uh, Newald's step-granddaughter who passed away this week. Our gospel lesson, our, our sermon is simply living the truth. And uh, I'm adding the gospel. The truth about us is sometimes the gospel needs to be a very strong foundation in our lives and in our church. It's a foundation for stewardship, by the way, our giving, our, our way of living our lives as uh, God's faithful people. And the truth is, sometimes we're afraid of the gospel, and we're going to see that in our uh, lesson from Timothy today. Let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness as found on page five of your, of your bulletin. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the only sovereign who, dwell, who, who dwells in light, Jesus Christ who came to save sinners, and the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of overflowing grace, we come to you with repentant hearts. Forgive us for shallow thankfulness. Forgive us for passing by the ones in need. Forgive us for setting our hopes on fleeting treasures. Forgive us our neglect and thoughtlessness. Bring us home from the wilderness of sin and strengthen us to serve you in all that we do and say. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. There is joy in heaven over every sinner who repents. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for us all, your sins are forgiven you. You are made free. Rejoice with the angels and with one another. We are home in God's mercy, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. be with you. And also with you. Almighty and mer most merciful God, your bountiful goodness fills all creation. Keep us safe from all that may hurt us, that whole and well in body and spirit, may we may with grateful hearts accomplish all that you would have us do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from 2 Kings. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served as Naaman's wife, served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Not in the reading, the king of Aramea sent an introductory letter to the king of Israel. Now, when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? 
Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would not you have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. The word of the Lord. from 2 Timothy. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. This is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. The saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good, but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. 
he prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children up. And you can all come and sit in the first pew with me. Here, Lucy, why don't you come and sit right next to me? Yeah, there you go. We're going to see um, a PowerPoint. Uh, Jesus, it's called Jesus Heals the Ten Lepers. I don't know if I ever showed you this one. I don't know if I'm clicking over there. There we go. Oh. Here we go. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, he met ten men who had leprosy. Anybody know what leprosy is? It's a terrible skin disorder. I have seen some people with leprosy where their flesh starts coming off. Some people say it's because they don't feel pain and they burn themselves and things like that, but on their face and their noses are coming off. They're just terrible pictures. So they weren't allowed to go near anyone, so they were outcast from society. And it says, as he was going, as Jesus was going into a village, he met the ten men who had the leprosy. Because they were considered to be unclean, they stood at a distance and called out with a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. By the way, when we sing the Kyrie, we're singing, Jesus, have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And here's the good news. As they went, they were cleansed. They no longer had the leprosy. See how they're celebrating? One came back when he saw he was healed. He came back praising God with a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? He wants to know what happened to the other nine. Why didn't they come back? Now, what can we learn from this? Anybody have any idea? Well, we'll see what my slide says. One of them, when he was healed, came back. Where are the other nine, Jesus asked. So often we go on our way rejoicing. Good things happen to us, but our lives are not complete. They're sort of hollow until we stop go back, give praise to God, give thanks and praise to God, okay? It makes us feel more complete and better. All right? God gives us many good gifts. Uh, we should constantly thank him and remember to share. Let us pray. Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all your good gifts. Give us thankful hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats.
I was, uh, Mick and I were at the church camp out on Friday night. And it was when we returned yesterday afternoon, we found out I had a message on our home machine, two messages actually, about the disaster that happened in the playground. It's always when you're away, something happens, right? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Simply, living simply the truth, the truth about ourselves and the gospel. Have you ever been afraid of the gospel? You know, you're talking to somebody who just moved to town, they're a church person, Ever have that problem of being afraid to say, oh, why don't you check out Messiah Lutheran Church? Ever have that problem? No? <laughs> or maybe, you know, that's so far from your mind, you don't even think of that. Yes, we are culturally oppressed, are we not? I remember when... Uh, I first became a Rotarian. I was asked to head up the committee that uh, found people to give them invocation at the beginning of the meeting. And I was told by the uh, former chairperson, he says, I, I've gotten all kinds of calls about people who are irritated when people end their prayers in Jesus' name talking about Jesus. Can you have your people pray politically correct prayers? Cultural oppression, right? I don't want to share the God. I don't want to pe people to think I'm pushy, right? I don't want them to think I'm a fanatic. I'm not. So we wind up being afraid of the gospel. Okay. Or how about this? Put on a happy faith. Sort of a meaningless platitude, isn't it? And we'll find out why. God's love, faith, cost something. It doesn't cost us, but it costs something. Or God loves you and so do I. I mean, it is important, it is the truth, but sometimes it's just a happy platitude. Second Timothy. Timothy was actually afraid of the gospel in his congregation. He had people in his congregation that were complaining to him that it's not about the gospel. It's not the gospel. It's about more, a moral life and morality. And so Timothy had these, he, he was succumbing, and, and that's why we have these words from the author of 2 Timothy. Uh, don't forget the gospel. That's the important thing. That's the real issue. And notice how it's put. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. This is the gospel. Raised from the dead. Means he had to die first, right? A descendant of David. There's some history there. That is my gospel, for which I suffer, suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. So what is the gospel? Maybe we need to begin there. Let's take a trip, a hike through the Old Testament. We're going to look way back to the story of Hannah. Everybody remember that story? Hannah was barren. To be a barren woman, talk about cultural oppression. To be a, a woman who did not bear children meant in her culture that she was worthless. What good are you? You have no children. You need children. Children help our community because we have more workers in the field. 
children help our community because they'll help us prosper. If you cannot have children, that's your purpose, Hannah. If you cannot have children, you are worthless. She felt worthless. Not only that, who's going to take care of her in her old age? And you better have at least seven children because only two might survive to adulthood. She had none. She goes to the temple and prays, and she's praying so fervently. Eli thought she was drunk and scolded her. And she said, no, no, I'm praying to God that I could bear a child, and if it's a son, I'm going to dedicate him to the temple. He will be yours. Eli, realizing his sons are corrupt, can use the extra hand around the, the temple. So he said, God, grant your request, I pray. Well, she did. But notice, women, the culture, of course the culture oppressed them, but we're oppressed. I felt a little oppressed getting dressed this morning. Would have much rather been in blue jeans and a t-shirt like I was when I was camping than wear what I'm wearing. My grandson says, Grandpa, why are you wearing that? T talking about my sport coat. And I said, it's my uniform. He goes, okay. See how oppressed I am? Isn't that terrible? <laughs> So is, was Hannah an oppressed woman? Yes, a woman, but we're oppressed. Timothy was oppressed. He was afraid now to proclaim the gospel. Let's uh, shoot to uh, something, a prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 54. Sing, barren one who did not bear, Burst into song and shout, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate woman will be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. Now why would Isaiah possibly speak so positively about a barren woman? That she should rejoice. Her children will be more than that of someone who is married. Isaiah continues and he suggests that the barren woman will have God as her husband. Now, if we step back, we can see where this good news comes from because something happened in chapter 53. We have one of the uh, suffering servant songs. And in it we see that intrinsic value now comes not from what society says makes me valuable, but from God Almighty. Surely he has bore our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned into our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because of that suffering servant, because of what that prophecy of Isaiah in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah that reveals to us the love of God, that reveals that God was one who suffered. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises we are healed. How much does God care for us and love us? It's not a mere 
rosy platitude. It was a costly love. It cost God something to love us, to reveal his love to us. Suffering, pain, costly. And now, Hannah, a barren one, if she heard this, she could say, my value is not in having children. My value is being loved by God, who even meets me in my suffering. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, forgiveness is a form of suffering. Have you ever noticed that? If you're going to forgive someone, if you want revenge, but you let it pass and forgive the person anyway. You hurt. It costs you something to do that. Oh, I so much wanted revenge. I so much wanted to get back at that person. Oh, I suffer instead. Suffering. Forgiveness is a form of suffering. Our holy God was not going to pay us back. For we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Instead, he would have to suffer. So Isaiah 50, 53 is God suffering for us. And now I can truly realize and recognize God's love. It's a deep love. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he writes to Th Timothy, that this is the gospel. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, which means he died. Tremendous suffering. He was a descendant of David. That means he has earthly roots and lineage. This is my gospel, he says. And now I suffer for that gospel. And he's suggesting, and Timothy, you should too. If it really hits us, the profound, I, I'm just, what I'm trying to do is help us realize how profoundly remarkable the gospel is. So we have cultural freedom. My worth is not determined by culture, but by the suffering love of God. My worth is not determined by the house I live in, or the car I drive, or the clothes I wear. Charles Dickens, in The Tale of Two Cities, gives an excellent illustration of someone suffering, showing suffering love for another. If you remember the story, it took place in the, during the French Revolution, 1775 to 1780, somewhere in there, and two characters. One is Charles Darnay. He's a French aristocrat. And Charles Darnay, uh, he's, he, he's sick and tired of the abuses of the aristocracy toward the poor in Spain. So he's on the outs even with his own family. And Charles Darnay, for, for instance, his uncle goes riding through town on his carriage, his carriage runs over a peasant boy, kills him. Oh, so what? He shouldn't have been there. So Charles Darnay is on the outs. And then we have Sidney Carton. Sidney Carton is a lawyer, um, an alcoholic, not too many prospects in life. But Sidney and Charles fall in love with the same woman. Lucy, a doctor's daughter. Lucy chooses Charles, the aristocrat. And now, Sidney, uh, heartbroken, forlorn, trying to prove himself someone of worth. Charles is eventually arrested by the French government sentenced to the guillotine, going to have his head chopped off. The night before that is to happen, 
Sidney goes into the prison. He's, of course, a lawyer. And when he meets Charles, they talk, and he sort of tricks Charles into changing clothes with him. They look remarkably the same. And then Sidney says, Charles, how about you and I changing places? After all, you're a husband and a father. He said, I have no one. And Charles will hear nothing of it, refuses, demands that Sidney go away. But Sidney had already drugged him, so when Charles passes out, he already arranged to have his, him taken out of the prison, and as he's carried out, Sidney takes his place. A little catch happens, though, that a, little, uh, a seamstress who knew Charles, she's afraid to die, so she wants to seek out a friend, a companion. So she finds Sidney masquerading as Charles, and Sidney tries to keep his head turned so she doesn't recognize him. And she starts talking to Sidney as though, as though he is Charles and that he would remember things. And finally she recognizes that this is not Charles. And she goes, oh my. She goes, and Sidney tries to quiet her down, and, Sydney, uh, and the seamstress says, you're going to die for him. And Charles, or Sidney says, yes, I'm going to die for Charles, and for his wife, and for his children. And then she says, the seamstress says, by the way, notice when Sid Sidney takes Charles' identity, Sidney's peace passes to Charles, Charles' death passes to Sidney. The seamstress says, I didn't think I had the courage to die, but if I could hold your hand, the hand of one so brave, I think I might be able to die. So they hold hands, and she dies first, and then Sidney. See how his death even gave strength and courage to someone who he didn't think he was dying for. So where are you? Jesus' peace passes to us. This is the gospel. Jesus' peace passes to us. And our death passes to Jesus. That's the gospel. God on the cross dying for us. Jesus' peace passes to us. Our death passes to Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, this is the gospel. Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descendant of David. By the way, that's called substitutionary atonement. <laughs> Yeah, that's a word you just, we don't hear anymore, do we? So remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel. It cost God something. He suffered to love us. God loves you and so do I. Yes, so true. But it's not that glib. He suffered. It cost God greatly. So we have a reversal of values, a renovation of identity. Culture does not have to define me anymore. I'm defined by the love of God. I have intrinsic worth of my own. As Martin Luther said, we're beggars. 
before the grace of God. Oh, please, God, let that transaction happen. Take my death. Give me your peace. Lepers, ready to be cleansed. We who once were dead are now alive. It should give us great strength to hold the hand of one who would die for us. Gives us straight strength. Now I can stand for justice, even if people are offended. I can pray and work for the poor and the destitute. Why? We who once were dead are now alive. The gospel, the costly gospel. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Set free by the truth of God's gracious love, we pray for the church, the world, and all of God's good creation. O God, we pray for the church on earth. 
that those who live with stigma and prejudice may know your compassion, and those who stay at a distance because of fear and rejection may be embraced and healed. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the marginalized in our society. We think of those with AIDS, the Zika virus, poverty, and addictions. We pray especially for the healing of the person who drove into our playground. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for leaders in our town, our region, our country, and across the globe. We remember especially the people of Haiti, the Caribbean, and the East Coast suffering because of Hurricane Matthew, those in Mexico fleeing the volcanic eruption, and those refugees from war-torn areas in the Middle East. Protect and give strength and courage to residents and those bringing aid. Send your peace and help us to work for justice for all people. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are sick or in pain, for those who feel unclean in body or spirit, and for all in need of healing. We remember especially Carolyn Callan, Doris Embritson, Sophia Fedgley, Emil Ghanem, Lou Graves, Dennis Holmes, Janet Littlecrow, Chris Marquart, Jan Snath, Sean Snellen, Chris Snyder, Lucy Stilwell, Paul Thompson, Bennett Wilkerson, and Kathy Zinter. Are there any others? We turn to thank you for all the abundant blessings from your hand. We're thankful that Jamie Alexander's tests came back negative and that Andrew Stephen Malcolm can breathe on his own. We give thanks for the faithful departed as we wait for the day when we join them in thanks and praise around your heavenly throne. We remember especially Sidney Plaster and Maddie Bobrink. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, faithful God, we place ourselves and our prayers, spoken and unspoken, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Let us pray. Merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. All is ready. Today we commune via intinction. You'll receive the bread or a wafer in your hand. Hold on until the chalice comes by and dip or intinct it into the chalice. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We come again to you, O God, giving you thanks that in this feast of mercy you have embraced us and healed us, making us one in the body of Christ. Go with us on our way, equip us for every good work, that we may continue to give you thanks by embracing others with mercy and healing. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. I would encourage you to read your messenger. Next Friday is the, um, Campbell's Maze Days and Pumpkin Patch. And you can read all the other ones in, uh, in your bulletin. Pastor? Yes. We want to thank Marilyn, too, for organizing the hymns and her beautiful thing today. Oh, by the way, next year, 2017, 2017 is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's nailing the 95 theses on the Wittenberg Cathedral door. And it's unbelievable how many people are hounding me, these companies, to go to Germany and take people from the congregation. So I'm just asking, if you are interested at all, let me know. There's a flyer back there, and I have more that tell you about the particular trip from a company that is hounding me. So I'm going to ask you for a couple of weeks. And if we don't have enough interest, I'm dropping it. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, we have a lot of kids that go to Camp Tomashinga every year, and it's getting bigger, and we're trying to have a pretty nice group go. But they have regular maintenance and things like that that they need to do on the camp itself. So we have been doing, um, for the month of October, we're saving change. So quarters for camp, we're gonna be out here and we'll have a little bucket you can throw your spare change in. And then at the end of the month, we'll let you guys know how much we raised for Tomashinga for all their regular maintenance and things like that. Sorry, and one other thing. <laughs> if we have anyone in here that is willing to be a substitute uh, Sunday school teacher or to help out with Sunday school, even if it's on a part-time basis or as a helper in a classroom, that would be phenomenal. And talk to me or Julie Brunell. Thank you. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
guided by the gospel, we welcome all. Go in peace, remember the poor.